Hello everyone, it's me, John Lorden, here again with another Brain Scratch Searchlight episode for you. Thank you so much for joining me here today. We are doing the second part of a two-parter, researched by Miko Starshine. Thank you so much for your help on this case. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, last week on the Jessica Runyon's case, I mentioned that there might be some connections, actually one very strong connection to the case that we're going to talk about this week. This week's case is the case of Kara Kopetsky. And here we have a digital missing poster for her, uh, Kara Kopetsky. It's saying her age now is 22. Um, actually, now it would be 26. Her birthday is February 17th, meaning that in about a, week, a little over a week from when I'm shooting this, she would actually be turning 27 years old. Date of birth, February 17th, 1990. Sex female, race white, hair brown, eyes hazel, height five foot five inches tall, weight 110 pounds. She was last seen on May 4th of 2007. Her ears are pierced twice. Her navel is pierced. She has a scar on her forehead. And when she was last seen, she was wearing a white tank top, a gray pullover sweater, jeans, and black and white checkered shoes. Uh, of course, they have contact information here. I'll be sure to copy the contact information in the description box below, as well as all the links that we're reviewing on today's case. Jumping over to www.searchingforkara.com. This is a website. Um, I'm not sure if it's put together by the family or a friend of the family, but here we get a bit of a brief description of what happened as well as some footage of the last time she was seen. Friday, May 4th, 2007. The morning started out just like any other morning. Kara decided to walk to school just a few blocks away instead of having her mom drive her. Later that morning, she called her mom to bring her a book for one of her classes that she had forgotten at home. Kara also asked her mom to wash her work clothes since she had to work that afternoon after school. Mom took the book up to the school and left it in the office for Kara to pick up later. At some point, Kara did pick up the book from the office. What happened next still remains a mystery, uh, almost 10 years after the fact now. Kara did not come home from school that day and did not show up for work that afternoon. Her mom and stepdad called her repeatedly and called around looking for her before reporting her missing that evening. It has been confirmed that the last phone call on her cell phone was about 10.30 that morning. Since then, the police have determined that either the cell phone has been shut off or the battery has run down. In addition to that, there has been no activity on her bank account and nothing is missing from her house. All of her clothes, belongings, and her new iPod that I guess she was given the previous Christmas uh, were still in her bedroom. The police and family have talked to her friends and no one has seen or had contact with Kara since she disappeared. And jumping down to this video clip here, here is the last footage of her uh, walking out of the school. And it's not known uh, what happens from there. I guess, I don't know if the school didn't have any external cameras or if they just didn't happen to catch her, but we only know that she's walking towards the exit for the school. We have no idea if she walked down the street, if someone picked her up, um, which is kind of important when you get to some of the other details in this case. But let's keep going with the info they have on this page here. Thursday, May 17th, 2007, three persons reported seeing Kara at a gas station slash Burger King in Lewisburg, Kansas, along with a young male. Unfortunately, the video surveillance equipment was not in working order and this sighting could not be confirmed. It should be noted that a girl who has been mistaken to be Kara worked at a nearby business at the time of the reported sighting. Um, I don't know if there's a whole lot to that sighting or not. Uh, over at the Charlie Project, they actually have a composite sketch that was done of the man that she supposedly was with. Uh, let's just jump over and take a look at it real quick. Here we go. So this is the composite of the man that she supposedly was with. Um, and also, I just I love how the Charlie Project puts these photo montages together. So here is a montage of a bunch of different photos of Kara, uh, including an age progression that was done to the age 23, which was done around 2013. You can see here on the lower right. And this website reports from May 17th to present, the police department has followed up on leads as they've come in, but none have led them to find Kara. Uh, there's not a whole lot more to this website. A couple of annual events that they've done to uh, keep awareness raised in this case. And I really have to point out that her family has done 
a really amazing job of keeping awareness raised around this case. There is a lot of media out there. Um, as a matter of fact, I found a very good article kind of paying tribute to the family and the excellent job they've been doing. We're going to hit at the end of this episode. Um, but it's one of those things, I talk about it all the time in Searchlight. Uh, there's this strangely inspirational thing that happens when I see families that are faced with this and how they're able to persevere. I mean, we're talking about a decade that this girl has been missing and her family is still very active trying to keep awareness raised. They have a walk for her. This website also mentions an annual fish fry that they do. Uh, those annual events can really help because typically it's pretty easy to get media to recognize those events and then they go on and retell the story on their channels and once again, get those pictures out there and maybe someone that has some information will come forward at some point. There is a very good uh, NAMIS profile uh, built up for her. Um, pretty much same information that we've covered already in terms of you know birthday, uh, race, ethnicity, sex. Uh, the circumstances of her disappearance. Uh, Carl was last seen on security video leaving Belton High School approximately 10.30 a.m. to skip third period which she did quite often. Uh, this was her junior year, just worth noting. She did not return to school and has not been seen since. She had called her mother earlier that morning to bring her a book and asked her to wash her work clothes since she had to work that night. Her debit card was left in her school locker. Her cell phone and her purse are still missing. And once again, it mentions the things that were left at her house. You know, she didn't take any clothes, so the family is really trying to get the message out there that she did not run away. And they have a bit of a good reason for doing that. There is at least one police report that seems to be written in a very strange way, alluding to the fact that Kara's uh, family had called the police department and spoken to them about her running away two days before she went missing. Now, her family adamantly denies this. They say that that report is a complete fabrication. Um, it's kind of tough. There's some articles I've seen that mention the family specifically stating, this is not a kid that has a history of running away, but I also keep bumping into this information that, well, she might have been known to run away on occasion. And then you have this police report. Um, the police chief is remaining very tight-lipped. Uh, there's a local affiliate station out there that has been really trying to press into that and get some more information. They have the reports, they can see what the reports say, but they basically can't get interviews with anyone from the Belton police or the police chief to help them straighten out that discrepancy. But according to the family, that first report is just a total fabrication and nothing actually happened on May 2nd in terms of uh, Kara disappearing. This was specifically on May 4th when she went missing. Another interesting little tidbit that comes out of the NAMIS profile, we see that uh, she also left behind an entire carton of cigarettes minus one pack. Um, I can tell you as a former smoker, if I was going somewhere, I certainly would not leave my cigarettes behind if I was running away from home or something like that. Um, so just w once again, just another little notch on the side of this is probably not a voluntary situation with her running away. And there's much more information that we'll get to um, to also sway our opinion on that. I'm now bringing up the timeline that was put together by Miko Starshine. Uh, this is something I ask my researchers to do. It really helps me get my head around the story a little bit. Uh, Saturday, April 28th, 2007, Kara claimed that Kyler used waited outside her workplace, Popeye's Chicken, for her to finish her shift, forced her into his vehicle and drove her around for a while against her will before she was able to jump out of the truck and escape. Eust was charged with misdemeanor disorderly conduct and assault in connection with the incident. Here is that big connecting piece that we have between both of the cases we've reviewed over the past two weeks. Jessica, we know that her vehicle was found and it was seemingly torched by Kyler, now rolling back to 2007, talking about this disappearance. It looks like Kara was being somewhat harassed by Kyler. Now, the main difference here is uh, Kyler was actually a boyfriend of Kara's. They were kind of on again, off again. She had talked about having some trouble. I've seen some reports that on social media, she had mentioned that that relationship was ending or was over. Possibly one of those things upset him, I don't know. But um, we have an instance here where 
he is literally kidnapping her at some point and she has to dr jump out of a truck to escape the situation. Monday, April 30th, 2007, Kara Kopetsky and her mother, Rhonda Beckford, filed a restraining order against Kyler, stating that he kidnapped and restrained Kara, choked her, and threatened to cut her throat during their nine-month relationship. Friday, May 4th, 2007, here we get to the day that she actually disappeared. Um, once again, we see she starts class at Belton High School. Once again, we see the note about the mother um, bringing her book and washing her work clothes. What we didn't see noted before was Kara actually had a 20 minute phone call with Kyler. An acquaintance later claimed that they had seen the two together that morning. When Kara leaves, four or five people saw her in the hallway at school uh, before she was seen by the school security cameras, but no one knew where she went. Uh, we know she never shows up at home which is only a few blocks away, and she doesn't make it to her four o'clock shift at Popeye's. Her mother and stepfather called her repeatedly and called around looking for her, uh, but their calls go straight to voicemail, and her mother winds up reporting her missing that evening. And we even see a note here that investigators initially believed she left of her own accord, as she had a history of running away for a few days at a time. Uh, we mentioned before her debit card was left in her locker, and they checked her checking account. The money was in there. It's never been touched. Her MySpace account has never been touched. Her Motorola Razor still missing. Uh, either the battery died or it was shut off on that day. And uh, Cara left all of her clothing, her cigarettes, her makeup, her hair straightener, the new iPod, and all of her personal belongings behind. There is literally no indicator, according to the information we're getting from the family, that there was any premeditation going on here, that she had packed a bag, everything of hers, all of her personal effects are left at home. On Thursday, May 10th, 2007, a judge grants the protection order request and schedules a hearing. Um, Thursday, May 17th, 2007, that's when we have that possible sighting of Kara. Um, I still highly question the validity of this sighting, but I did bump into something a little interesting. If you recall that picture that I had you look at at the Charlie Project of the unidentified individual here, um, if we look at pictures of Kyler now, it, it certainly does not seem to me that that is the same person. However, I did find some footage of Kyler from back in 2007 and his face was considerably leaner. Uh, it's, I don't know if he has kind of muscled up or bulked up throughout the years, but back in 2007, he almost looks like a different person to me, very lean face. And quite honestly, the features of this guy um, are not too far from what I'm seeing here outside of you know missing the big sideburns and his hair kind of going in the wrong direction. But the physical features of the face, um, it's, I guess it's possible. There's some possibility in my mind. Is there potentially some possibility that he kidnapped her again and took her on this road trip or something along those lines? I don't know. Um, was she struggling within herself about the restraining order that she was getting filed and you know, was trying to mend things with him and decided that she didn't want to face any of that, so she wanted to run away with him. I think there's some reason to put some thought into that, except we now know where he winds up years and years later, and of course, we don't know where Kara is to this very day. So if they did run away together, um, why would she decide to stay hidden and running away from her family if she's no longer with this guy? Uh, the logic there doesn't really hold up for me all that much, but between this picture and the picture of him from back in 2007, I can't say it's a great match, but I can't really discount that either. There might be something to that sighting that we're actually missing. But keep in mind, we have a girl who had been mistaken for Kara working at a nearby business um, at that location also. So very, very tough to know the truth of what's happening there. Into 2011, September 2011, Kyler was placed on probation for two years after he pled guilty to beating and choking his 18-year-old pregnant girlfriend in July of 2011. Uh, the victim also claimed that he told her, quote, I've killed people before, 
even ex-girlfriends out of sheer jealousy. I will kill you. She also stated that he told her that he could dispose of body parts in a pig pen on a family ranch. Uh, he also admitted to her that he had killed three kittens and would kill her family if she went to police. Uh, he is then also charged with two counts of animal abuse, July 5th and July 20th, both of 2011. 2012, we get another potential sighting of Kara in Indianapolis, Indiana, but police confirm that it is not her. And then we get to 2013, Kyler is sentenced to three years and nine months in federal prison, followed by three years of supervised release after pleading guilty to a felony drug trafficking count. I've seen some details about that drug charge. They say that it is some type of deal he was making, potentially importing a designer drug from China and that he got busted in that. Um, and then of course that leads up, him getting out of jail leads up to pretty much the events that we covered last week with the Jessica Runyon's case. Outside of Kyler, there is not a lot to talk about in terms of suspects. Uh, 41 Action News, the local affiliate that I mentioned previously that has been diving into this case um, fairly heavily over the years. Uh, when they recovered the police records, there was some mention of a few different things. Uh, someone no, only known as an un unidentified male, an anonymous male, um, brought a box to the police department supposedly of objects belonging to Kara. And he had stated that he was living in the apartment that Kyler used to live in and that he found this and took it into the police. Um, I've only seen it reported by 41 Action News. We have no idea what's in that box, uh, what it might contain, how Kyler got it. I mean, they were dating. It is reasonable that she might have left some things at his apartment. Um, but you have this new character. We don't know this guy, this anonymous person that brought this box in, and he has a box of personal effects belonging to her. Would he be considered a suspect? Um, possibly, at least a person of interest. I don't know if the police have really chased that down, even if he was anonymous. We know that he's living or was living at the location that Kyler was living at. I don't think it'd be very hard to track down who that person is. Did police do that? It's very possible they did, and we just don't know about it because it hasn't been released publicly. But outside of that, um, I did see mention of one other person who killed another woman kind of close to this area around the time that Kara went missing, um, but he was tried for that, convicted for that, and it's weird because it seems like early on in that case they thought he might be related to Kara's case as well, but by the end of that case everyone was pretty much of the mind that that guy is not related to this situation at all. So it really comes down to Kyler, and there's a couple of interesting points here. Um, he cooperated with police when Kara went missing. He gave them an alibi that apparently no one has disproved. He's also passed a lie detector test. Now, admittedly, we've talked about on this channel before. I don't know if we've talked about it on this show a whole lot, but um, lie detector tests are not perfect. People can pass them. Um, there are methods of cheating lie detectors. Is this guy smart enough to employ one of those? I don't know, it's very possible. There's also the possibility that the person administering the test is not very good at their job. That is something that does sometimes happen. It does sometimes come up in certain cases. But the official word is he passed a lie detector test on this one, and he denies abusing Kara. Uh, when we talk about him in relation to Jessica's case, uh, we know that he is charged with burning her vehicle, uh, his grandfather is basically stating her vehicle was at his house. We know Kyler was staying at his house as well. And then it went and disappeared before 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it's heavily assumed, I think, that Kyler drove it five miles away and lit it on fire. Uh, but once again, when it comes to the actual disappearance, he seems to have an alibi. But we also know that Jessica was last seen with him at the party that they were at together the night before. So... Very, very strange. Um, it's, you know, one of those situations some people would say where there's smoke, there's fire. This guy has smoke all around him. We've got previous charges that he's been convicted for uh, related to not only abusing animals, but specifically abusing women. Uh, Kara herself was getting a restraining order based on him having abusive actions towards her. Uh, even if we discount Jessica's case and just look at it from Kara 
and previously, um, he looks like a very strong suspect to me. And then when you include Jessica's case, it's, it's almost off the chart. Um, I've pointed out on a couple of videos recently these articles by Heavy where they do these five fast facts. Um, they have one specifically on Kyler. I think we've talked about most of the points already, um, but I'm going to include this in the links below so you could review it for yourself as well. They also have a video linked here from 41 Action News. I really recommend you check it out. It's under this second bullet point about him being the former boyfriend of Kara. Talks about his previous uh, lengthy criminal record and apparently this guy likes taking pictures of himself uh, not wearing a whole lot of clothes. Also mentions his claim to have killed other women and the main point that hopefully maybe one of you out there could also help with the fact that police are asking for tips and he is being held on $50,000 bail. Once again, the information that you need to submit tips will be in the description box below. Now in terms of current news, um, we're going to jump over to the Cass County Democrat Missourian uh, at www.demo-mo.com. And this is an article that says, Mother Finds New Evidence in Kara Kopetsky Case. In short, they re-reviewed the video of the last day that she was seen, and it looks like she was wearing a bracelet. The mother is hoping that the bracelet might have been kept by the person that took her away, possibly as a trophy of some kind. I, I guess there's a fair chance of it. It has been known to happen that people do, will sometimes keep trophies, um, but to expect that, I don't, I don't know. It, it feels like, it's tough to say, but it feels like the family is extremely desperate. And of course they are. We're coming up on 10 years later and they think they know who did it. As a matter of fact, every court appearance that Kyler has made, one of their family members has been there, usually sitting as close to the front as they can. They want him to know they are watching every move of his. Um, so it's really, really tough. You, you see something like this and I'm hopeful, I really hope that that clue, pan, that clue will pan out for them. Um, but will it happen in the way that they're quite expecting? I don't know. I guess the best we can do is hope and, and keep our fingers crossed. And last but not least, we head over to KansasCity.com for this really well-written article, How Kara Kopetsky's Family Turned Her Story Into Lessons for Us All. But this article really sums it up um, very concisely towards the end. They deserve public recognition of the impact, the greater good that their love for Kara has inspired. There is no way to know how many police officers think twice before dismissively assuming that a teenage girl has simply run away because of Kara. There's no way to measure how many families have started difficult conversations with their teenage daughters, paying closer attention to the type of young men they choose to date because of Kara. There is no knowing how many young women may have realized that their boyfriend's angry jealousy is not love, but a symptom of a potential abuser because of Kara. For a young woman who hasn't been seen for nearly a decade, that's a profound legacy. Extremely well written, and that's why I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, her family really deserves a lot of credit for keeping this in the public eye uh, as much as they have been able to for 10 years now. So this is where I turn it over to you guys. Um, if you have friends that live in this area, please share this video with them. Let's get that awareness raised as much as we can as a group. And uh, please use the comments below to discuss this case further. To me, it's really frustrating that we don't know where these bodies are if both these women are actually deceased. I think that is going to be a major piece in getting these crimes solved. Um, outside of that, is there other possibilities going on here? Um, potentially, but we have a lot of information buzzing around Kyler and it's, it's tough because I've seen cases where this happens and then when we get to the truth of the case, that buzz isn't always right. In this case, I kind of feel like it might be on point, um, but you really don't know until you find out where those bodies are and then they're able to process those scenes and, and conduct further investigations from there. So it's, it's weird. I want to say they've got their guy. They just don't have him on the right charges yet, um, but it's very, very tough to know. 
you know, we did hear some mention of this supposed pig farm. I have heard this thing before about some pigs that will consume practically anything. Um, I think that should be looked into a bit. Um, but in Jessica's case, we have a very tight window of Kyler being able to dispose of that body. And I'm hopeful if she is indeed deceased, I'm hopeful that someone out there might have the information to let authorities find her. So I, I'm just putting that out there. Someone out there might have some info that could really help crack this case. And if you are that person, or if you think you know that person, I truly hope you'll do the right thing and help these families move forward in the processes they have to go through. This is this has been 10 years for one family, and it's been a number of very tough months for another family. If this guy is really responsible for what's happened to both of these women, um, why protect him? I just, I don't understand it. And I'm kind of weirdly getting this echo to Zuzu's case. It's just, it's so fresh in my mind right now, but this feels like a similar case, like a potential domestic dispute case. Things that went too far went wrong. In Zuzu's case, it looks like there's a lot of people that are going to pay for holding on to information that they shouldn't have held on to to try to protect a family member that did some very bad things. And I'm hopeful that in this case, we don't have the same thing happen. If you know someone that knows something, please urge them to do the right thing or see if they'll pass the information to you and then you call it in. Um, I've, I've done this myself. There's some people that just aren't able to pick up that phone, but if you can get the info from them, get the info and put it in the right hands. Put it in the hands of someone that can do something with it. Thank you so much, Brain Scratchers. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. I hope you are having a good day. I will see you again right back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arts channel.